Hello everyone, how's it going? My name is Patrick Hanna. I am covering um, Egyptian women during the Arab Spring uh, and the roles that they played, uh, particularly the uh, rhetorical forms or platforms that they utilized, the tools that they uh, decided that were going to be the most powerful or just felt like they uh, had the most traction or possibly um, that they could uh, do without encountering even more kind of opposition and, um, and just really harm because that's what they were facing. So hopping right into it, we'll scroll down over here. If you guys haven't already, check out the other videos on the other countries during the Arab Spring by my cohorts. Uh, they are fantastic videos and fantastic people who did awesome research. So here we have the Egyptian Revolution of 2011 and 2013. So they're, they're separated into two parts because the first one was to remove a dictator, um, Hosni Mubarak, uh, who ruled for 30 plus years, really uncontested. And the following one in 2013 of the basically US appointed um, uh, uh, Morsi, Mohamed Morsi. So uh, we'll cover women's role in both of these revolutions and uh, kind of the uh, evolution of women's rights uh, by the protesters or, or that was forced upon uh, the government by protesters. And it definitely was not without uh, some serious uh, backlash, but we'll get more into that in a minute. So here we go. The whole thing started on January 25th with a self-immolation. Uh, a, a protester basically sets themselves on fire uh, and that's the ultimate form of protest that's recognized around the world. Uh, this protester was following the, the lead of a, um, of, a, um, of a protester in Tanzania where a lot of this um, Arab Spring and it was the ad epicenter. That's where all the dominoes started to fall in line. Um, it, it's really a, a statement, right, for someone to, to set themselves on fire in front of the embassy or in front of the, uh, the government building. Um, Hosni Mubarak uh, briefly was a, as a guy who kind of took power uh, in the mid 80s and really just, he declared a state of emergency and kind of held uh, complete control over everything. I mean, uh, all the media, every everything you would expect a dictator to do, that's exactly what he was doing, right? I mean, control the police, the military, you name it. And so the people were really fed up with the extreme poverty and the corruption, uh, and they just really took to the square, uh, to hear square, to, to, to protest, right? To, to, to enact change that they, they had had enough. Um, kind of going along with that, uh, some 846 people were killed uh, across Egypt, there were three or four major cities where the protests had taken place, and about 6,400 were injured. Um, so it's quite a bit uh, of uh, civil unrest and uh, police and military uh, kind of confrontation with civilians. And I would the numbers don't, the numbers speak for themselves. Right? They don't lie. They they were not afraid to use force. Uh, in fact, uh, Mubarak's uh, cabinet and some of his uh, staff you know, had even ordered them to use force on the protesters, um, lethal force at that, not just force, but lethal force. Um, goes without saying that they were tried and, and put in prison, uh, of course, after a few years, but uh, sure enough, they did face backlash and, and punishment, uh, rightfully so. Um, sexual harassment in Tahir Square is, was a serious issue, especially because um, men were not happy with um, the way that women were kind of pushing for more women's rights, uh, they definitely wanted to keep uh, the men did, to keep a like a patriarchal type rule um, over over women and didn't really um, didn't really appreciate women uh, being out there and voicing their opinions. Uh, they just felt like it wasn't a woman's place to do such a thing, and, and then they would harass them and sexually assault them. So obviously it's very backwards because the women need change just as much as anyone else. It affects everyone. So uh, it definitely took on a new meaning in terms of revolution, um, a double meaning at least. So women in the revolution, they, pro they protested Mubarak, like I had said, they were everywhere in the square. They were right alongside the men, but uh, men definitely took advantage of the women, women who may have been uh, 
maybe more secularly dressed uh, and you know it, they definitely did not approve so here we have um, the graffiti art which kind of shows a sexual assault a very big case where um, a, a woman was uh, harassed by like some two, 100 plus men almost 200 men and where they're all groping her and using sharp objects to um, rape her uh, needless to say so women were fighting for more representation, uh, like in the constitution and rights and government uh, and everything. Uh, and it was an uphill battle. They really didn't get it. They, they got um, really denied um, representation uh, in every kind of way. And, and, they, and by doing so, the, the government and society, the Egyptian society really downplayed the role that women played um, in, in the revolution and, and in the writing of the new constitution for uh, Egyptians. Uh, on March 8th, that was really a turning point where uh, women and men uh, who supported the women uh, really took to the streets. So March 8th was International Women's Day. Uh, there were about 18-ish women uh, and some men who were in Tahir Square who were detained um, by the military, so government agency, and they were essentially uh, sexually assaulted by the military. And when I say sexually assaulted, I mean they were stripped down into their underwear, um, which blue bra woman, the, the woman happened to be wearing a blue bra, um, sit uh, sit which in Arabic, which is the best of the girls. Um, and out of the 18 women, I believe 17 were uh, forced uh, to undergo virginity testing, which we all know is a whole hoax of things. And if you haven't heard that TED talk, there's a whole TED talk on how the hymen is not uh, an indication of a woman's virginity. So definitely educate yourself if you haven't seen that video. Um, so this was a huge outrage, especially because Egypt is a, a severely or not severely, but a, a very conservative country. Uh, and so women, men like, they, they decided that this is enough, that they do not want anything to do with this, that uh, they need to take to the streets. And men uh, began to form a line in front of the women, um, obviously men who sided with them, I should preface, uh, to create a barrier between some of the police and the angry protesters. Then at the same time, you had um, Op Antish, which is basically um, there, it was an all woman, uh, like bodyguard, uh, political, not, it wasn't like a political affiliation, but they were uh, a group that dedicated themselves to protecting women, rescuing women. Um, and what really stood them apart was they were fighting the, um, the idea that uh, only men can protect women, right? So th these were women who were trained, who were training to go and rescue and help other women. So like I had said, they had faced, women had faced backlash um, there was a, another woman, Samira Ibrahim, um, who was uh, filmed, someone had filmed the encounter that the encounter she had with police. She was beaten um, senselessly and dragged uh, across the street in front of everyone, right, by, by military personnel who are there supposed to be bipartisan, protecting the people, keeping the peace. And yet here they are, um, you know, really just abusing their power and using scare tactics to try and keep their their rule uh, over society, which is, uh, you know, goes without saying, is absolutely a grotesque. Um, also, uh, so here we have this graffiti art uh, that that was popping up all over the place, mostly by women, uh, almost entirely by women, uh, that that really were trying to highlight the effects um, and, and the the situations that women were encountering. Um, so uh, this even gained more traction after Samira Ibrahim because there was um, kind of a, a like a forthcoming um, of, uh, of Egyptian women uh, on not necessarily Twitter, but um, on podcasts and TV shows, reality shows where they came on, on you know, primetime Egyptian television and talked about uh, their, their encounters with sexual harassment, sexual assault, and a lot of these types of, uh, of um, just horrific, horrific, um, horrific encounters, horrific situations that they had you know, um, faced. Uh, that also gained, you know, some traction on Twitter, and Twitter was also the the foreground of a lot of the um, 
groups that had uh, or coalitions that had been formed to protect women in Tahir Square from the uh, countless attacks, some 250 sexual assaults uh, that happened in Tahir Square. So it was pretty serious and it, Twitter really did um, help kind of uh, like boost the morale of women. Uh, and going with that and hand in hand with that, a, the, a lot of the women were um, who were on the t TV shows, on Twitter, who were, who were activists, they um, resisted the stigma and stigmatization and victimization of women who were, who were assaulted and who were subjected to this kind of horrific behavior. Um, and, and it really uh, kind of sparked a lot of, um, uh, just a, a lot more support within the Egyptian community. So in the end, women really, um, again, they were took to uh, a lot of the different platforms um, to fight this type of just, you know, I want to call it persecution because that's really what it was, right? It was persecution of women, uh, of their rights. It was and really anything to hold them down. And here we have them say, say no to sexual harassment. And it, it's a, it was a serious thing that um, they got a small victory where they had kind of made the laws a little more stringent, um, where it was a little easier to prosecute some of the men who, who have participated at, in the uh, assaults that happened in Tahir Square. But uh, it was really short lived. Uh, and I, that's why I call it a small victory because you still have you know, these three women here who were imprisoned to, to, to cut it short. They were imprisoned for the activism, for standing up for women, for, for using their voice and their platform, whether that was graffiti or a podcast uh, or music. Uh, they were all just basically um, you know, shut down. And, and really that doesn't do anything but again, you know, spark more um, spark a fire and more women to stand up and say more. And that's, that's why I really wanted to talk about graffiti as a political tool, because it's something that has always been so sub subversive uh, of like big society and, 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 and like um, the views that people kind of force onto, uh, onto others unwillingly. So um, uh, I really enjoyed that, that the fact that they had chose such a median um, and it was really new, something that was not common in the time uh, and it grabbed a lot of people's attention. Some of these uh, graffiti works took three, four days at a time to put together. So you know that they were really risking their lives, um, you know, life and limb, everything to, to be out there and get this message out there. Um, all in all, really, uh, Egyptian women are strong they definitely fought tooth and nail to get the little victories that they got. And um, even then, till today, they, they're still fighting for those rights. So uh, yeah, more power to them. I'm uh, staying behind them. And uh, thank you for coming to my talk. I really appreciate everyone being here. Uh, if you would like, definitely check out the next video uh, by one of my peers. Don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.